The Four Fists by F. Scott Fitzgerald This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Rato The Four Fists by F. Scott Fitzgerald at the present time no one I know has the slightest desire to hit Samuel Meredith. Possibly this is because a man over fifty is liable to be rather severely cracked at the impact of a hostile fist, but for my part I am inclined to think that all his hittable qualities have quite vanished. But it is certain that at various times in his life hittable qualities were in his face as surely as kissable qualities have ever lurked in a girl's lips. I'm sure everyone has met a man like that, been casually introduced, even made a friend of him, yet felt he was the sort who aroused passionate dislike, expressed by some in the involuntary clinching of fists, and in others by mutterings about taking a poke, and landing a swift smash in the eye, in the juxtaposition of Samuel Meredith's features, this quality was so strong that it influenced his entire life. What was it? Not the shape, certainly, for he was a pleasant-looking man from earliest youth, broad-browed with gray eyes that were frank and friendly. Yet I've heard him tell a room full of reporters angling for a success story that he'd be ashamed to tell them the truth, that they wouldn't believe it, that it wasn't one story but four that the public wouldn't want to read about a man who had been walloped into prominence. It all started at Phillips Andover Academy when he was fourteen. He'd been brought up on a diet of caviar and bellboy's legs in half the capitals of Europe, and it was pure luck that his mother had nervous prostration and had to delegate his education to less tender, less biased hands. At Andover he was given a roommate named Gilly Hood. Gilly was thirteen, undersized and rather the school pet. From the September day when Mr. Meredith's valet stowed Samuel's clothing in the best bureau and asked on departing if there was anything else, Master Samuel, Gilly cried out that the faculty had played him false. He felt like an irate frog in whose bowl has been put goldfish. Good gosh, he complained to his sympathetic contemporaries. He's a damn stuck-up willy. He said, Are the crowd here, gentlemen? And I said, No, they're boys. And he said, Age didn't matter. And I said, Who said it did? Let him get fresh with me, the old pie-face. For three weeks Gilly endured in silence young Samuel's comments on the clothes and habits of Gilly's personal friends endured French phrases in conversation, endured a hundred half-feminine meannesses that show what a nervous mother can do to a boy if she keeps close enough to him. Then a storm broke in the aquarium. Samuel was out. A crowd had gathered to hear Gilly be wrathful about his roommate's latest sins. He said, oh, I don't like the windows open at night, he said, except only a little bit, complained Gilly. Go let him boss you. Boss me? You bet he won't. I open those windows, I guess, but the darn fool won't take turns shutting them in the morning. Make him, Gilly, why don't you? I'm gonna. Gilly nodded his head in fierce agreement. Don't you worry. He needn't think I'm any old butler. Let's see you make him. At this point the darn fool entered in person and included the crowd in one of his irritating smiles. Two boys said, Lo, Meredith. The others gave him a chilly glance and went on talking to Gilly, but Samuel seemed unsatisfied. Would you mind not sitting on my bed? He suggested politely to two of Gilly's particulars, who were perched very much at ease. Huh? My bed. Can't you understand English? This was adding insult to injury. There were several comments on the bed's sanitary condition and the evidence within it of animal life. "'What's the matter with your old bed?' demanded Gilly truculently. "'The bed's all right, but—' 
Gilly interrupted the sentence by rising and walking up to Samuel. He paused several inches away and eyed him fiercely. "'You and your crazy old bed,' he began. "'You and your crazy—' "'Go to it, Gilly,' murmured someone. "'Show the darn fool.' Samuel returned the gaze coolly. "'Well,' he said finally, "'it's my bed.' He got no further, for Gilly hauled off and hit him succinctly in the nose. "'Yeah, Gilly! Show the big bully! Just let him touch you, he'll see!' The group closed in on them, and for the first time in his life Samuel realized the insuperable inconvenience of being passionately detested. He gazed around helplessly at the glowering, violently hostile faces. He towered a head taller than his roommates, so if he hit back he'd be called a bully and have half a dozen more fights on his hands within five minutes. Yet if he didn't, he was a coward. For a moment he stood there facing Gilly's blazing eyes, and then, with a sudden choking sound, he forced his way through the ring and rushed from the room. The month following bracketed the thirty most miserable days of his life. Every waking moment he was under the lashing tongues of his contemporaries. His habits and mannerisms became butts for intolerable witticism, and, of course, the sensitiveness of adolescence was a further thorn. He considered that he was a natural pariah, that the unpopularity at school would follow him through life. When he went home for the Christmas holidays, he was so despondent that his father sent him to a nerve specialist. When he returned to Andover, he arranged to arrive late so that he could be alone in the bus during the drive from station to school. Of course, when he had learned to keep his mouth shut, everyone promptly forgot all about him. The next autumn, with his realization that consideration for others was the discreet attitude, he made good use of the clean start given him by the shortness of boyhood memory. By the beginning of his senior year, Samuel Meredith was one of the best-liked boys of his class, and no one was any stronger for him than his first friend and constant companion, Gilly Hood. 2. Samuel became the sort of college student who in the early nineties drove tandems and coaches and tally hoes between Princeton and Yale and New York City to show that they appreciated the social importance of football games. He believed passionately in good form. His choosing of gloves, his tying of ties, his holding of reins were imitated by impressionable freshmen. Outside of his own set he was considered rather a snob, but as his set was the set, it never worried him. He played football in the autumn, drank highballs in the winter, and rode in the spring. Samuel despised all those who were merely sportsmen without being gentlemen, or merely gentlemen without being sportsmen. He lived in New York and often brought home several of his friends for the weekend. Those were the days of the horse car, and in case of a crush, it was, of course, the proper thing for anyone of Samuel's set to rise and deliver his seat to a standing lady with a formal bow. One night in Samuel's junior year, he boarded a car with two of his intimates. There were three vacant seats. When Samuel sat down, he noticed a heavy-eyed laboring man sitting next to him who smelt objectionably of garlic, sagged slightly against Samuel, and, spreading a little as a tired man will, took up quite too much room. The car had gone several blocks when it stopped for a quartet of young girls, and, of course, the three men of the world sprang to their feet and proffered their seats with due observance of form. Unfortunately, the laborer, being unacquainted with the coat of neckties and tally hose, failed to follow their example, and one young lady was left at an embarrassed stance. Fourteen eyes glared reproachfully at the barbarian. Seven lips curled slightly. But the object of scorn stared stolidly into the foreground in sturdy unconsciousness of his despicable conduct. Samuel was the most violently affected. He was humiliated that any male should so conduct himself. He spoke aloud. "'There's a lady standing,' he said sternly. That should have been quite enough, but the object of scorn only looked up blankly. 
The standing girl tittered and exchanged nervous glances with her companions. But Samuel was aroused. "'There's a lady standing,' he repeated, rather raspingly. The man seemed to comprehend. "'I pay my fare,' he said quietly. Samuel turned red and his hands clinched, but the conductor was looking their way, so at a warning nod from his friends he subsided into sullen gloom. They reached their destination and left the car, but so did the laborer, who followed them, swinging his little pail. Seeing his chance, Samuel no longer resisted his aristocratic inclination. He turned around and, launching a full-featured dime-novel sneer, made a loud remark about the right of the lower animals to ride with human beings. In a half-second the workman had dropped his pail and let fly at him. Unprepared, Samuel took the blow neatly on the jaw and sprawled full length into the cobblestone gutter. "'Don't oh, laugh at me,' cried his assailant. "'I've been working all day. I'm tired as hell.' As he spoke, the sudden anger died out of his eyes, and the mask of weariness dropped again over his face. He turned and picked up his pail. Samuel's friends took a quick step in his direction. Wait. Samuel had risen slowly and was motioning back. Sometime, somewhere, he'd been struck like that before. Then he remembered. Gilly Hood. In the silence, as he dusted himself off, the whole scene in the room at Andover was before his eyes, and he knew intuitively that he'd been wrong again. This man's strength, his rest, was the protection of his family. He had more use for his seat in the streetcar than any young girl. "'It's all right,' said Samuel gruffly. "'Don't touch him. I've been a damn fool.' Of course, it took more than an hour or a week for Samuel to rearrange his ideas on the essential importance of good form. At first he simply admitted that his wrongness had made him powerless, as it had made him powerless against Gilly. But eventually his mistake about the workman influenced his entire attitude. Snobbishness is, after all, merely good breeding grown dictatorial. So Samuel's code remained, but the necessity of imposing it upon others had faded out in a certain gutter. Within that year his class had somehow stopped referring to him as a snob. 3. After a few years Samuel's university decided that it had shone long enough in the reflected glory of his neckties, so they declaimed to him in Latin charged him ten dollars for the paper which proved him irretrievably educated, and sent him into the turmoil with much self-confidence, a few friends, and the proper assortment of harmless bad habits. His family had by that time started back to shirt-sleeves, through a sudden decline in the sugar market, and it had already unbuttoned its vest, so to speak, when Samuel went to work. His mind was that exquisite tabula rasa that a university education sometimes leaves, but he had both energy and influence, so he used his former ability as a dodging halfback and twisting through Wall Street crowds as a runner for a bank. His diversion was women. There were half a dozen, two or three debutantes, an actress in a minor way, a grass widow, and one sentimental little brunette who was married and lived in a little house in Jersey City. They had met on a ferry boat. Samuel was crossing from New York on business, he'd been working several years by this time, and he helped her look for a package that she had dropped in the crush. "'Do you come over often?' he inquired casually. "'Just to shop,' she said shyly. She had great brown eyes and the pathetic kind of little mouth. I've only been married three months, and we find it cheaper to live over here. Does he, does your husband like your being alone like this? She laughed, a cheery young laugh. Oh, dear me, no. We were to meet for dinner, but I must have misunderstood the place. He'll be awfully worried. Well, said Samuel disapprovingly, he ought to be. If you'll allow me, I'll see you home. She accepted his offer thankfully, so they took the cable car together. 
When they walked up the path to her little house, they saw a light there. Her husband had arrived before her. "'He's frightfully jealous,' she announced, laughingly apologetic. "'Very well,' answered Samuel, rather stiffly. "'I'd better leave you here.' She thanked him, and, waving a good night, he left her. That would have been quite all if they hadn't been on Fifth Avenue one morning a week later. She started and blushed and seemed so glad to see him that they chatted like old friends. She was going to her dressmaker's, eat lunch alone at Tain's, shop all afternoon, and meet her husband on the ferry at five. Samuel told her that her husband was a very lucky man. She blushed again and scurried off. Samuel whistled all the way back to his office, but about twelve o'clock he began to see that pathetic, appealing little mouth everywhere, and those brown eyes. He fidgeted when he looked at the clock. He thought of the grill downstairs where he lunched and the heavy male conversation thereof, and opposed to that picture appeared another, a little table at Taines, with the brown eyes and the mouth a few feet away. A few minutes before twelve-thirty he dashed on his hat and rushed for the cable car. She was quite surprised to see him. "'Why, hello,' she said. Samuel could tell that she was just pleasantly frightened. "'I thought we might lunch together. It's so dull eating with a lot of men.' She hesitated. "'Why, I suppose there's no harm in it. How could there be?' It occurred to her that her husband should have taken lunch with her, but he was generally so hurried at noon. She told Samuel all about him. He was a little smaller than Samuel, but, oh, much better looking. He was a bookkeeper and not making a lot of money, but they were very happy and expected to be rich within three or four years. Samuel's grass widow had been in a quarrelsome mood for three or four weeks and through contrast he took an accentuated pleasure in this meeting. So fresh was she, and earnest, and faintly adventurous. Her name was Marjorie. They made another engagement. In fact, for a month they lunched together two or three times a week. When she was sure that her husband would work late, Samuel took her over to New Jersey on the ferry, leaving her always on the tiny front porch after she'd gone in and lit the gas, to use the security of his masculine presence outside. This grew to be a ceremony, and it annoyed him. Whenever the comfortable glow fell out through the front windows, that was his congé. Yet he never suggested coming in, and Marjorie didn't invite him. Then, when Samuel and Marjorie had reached a stage in which they sometimes touched each other's arms gently, just to show that they were very good friends, Marjorie and her husband had one of those ultra-sensitive, supercritical quarrels that couples never indulge in unless they care a great deal about each other. It started with a cold mutton chop or a leak in the gas jet, and one day Samuel found her in tains with dark shadows under her brown eyes and a terrifying pout. By this time Samuel thought he was in love with Marjorie, so he played up the quarrel for all it was worth. He was her best friend and patted her hand and leaned down close to her brown curls while she whispered in little sobs what her husband had said that morning, and he was a little more than her best friend when he took her over to the ferry in a hansom. Marjorie, he said gently when he left her as usual on the porch, if at any time you want to call on me, remember that I am always waiting, always waiting. She nodded gravely and put both her hands in his. I know, she said. I know you're my friend, my best friend. Then she ran into the house and he watched there until the gas went on. For the next week Samuel was in a nervous turmoil. Some persistently rational strain warned him that at bottom he and Marjorie had little in common. But in such cases there is usually so much mud in the water that one can seldom see the bottom. Every dream and desire told him that he loved Marjorie, wanted her, had to have her. The quarrel developed. Marjorie's husband took to staying in New York until late at night, came home several times disagreeably overstimulated, 
and made her generally miserable. They must have had too much pride to talk it out, for Marjorie's husband was, after all, pretty decent. So it drifted on from one misunderstanding to another. Marjorie kept coming more and more to Samuel. When a woman can accept masculine sympathy, it is much more satisfactory to her than crying to another girl. But Marjorie didn't realize how much she'd begun to rely on him, how much he was part of her little cosmos. One night, instead of turning away when Marjorie went in and lit the gas, Samuel went in too, and they sat together on the sofa in the little parlor. He was very happy. He envied their home, and he felt that the man who neglected such a possession out of stubborn pride was a fool and unworthy of his wife. But when he kissed Marjorie for the first time, she cried softly and told him to go. He sailed home on the wings of desperate excitement, quite resolved to fan the spark of romance, no matter how big the blaze or who was burned. At the time, he considered that his thoughts were unselfishly of her. In a later perspective, he knew that she had meant no more to him than the white screen in a motion picture. It was just Samuel, blind, desirous. Next day at Taines, when they met for lunch, Samuel dropped all pretense and made frank love to her. He had no plans, no definite intentions except to kiss her lips again, to hold her in his arms and feel that she was very little and pathetic and lovable. He took her home, and this time they kissed until both their hearts beat high. Words and phrases formed on his lips. And then suddenly there were steps on the porch. A hand tried the outside door. Marjorie turned dead white. Wait, she whispered to Samuel in a frightened voice. But in angry impatience at the interruption, he walked to the front door and threw it open. Everyone has seen such scenes on the stage, seen them so often that when they actually happen, people behave very much like actors. Samuel felt that he was playing a part, and the lines came quite naturally. He announced that all had a right to lead their own lives and looked at Marjorie's husband menacingly, as if daring him to doubt it. Marjorie's husband spoke of the sanctity of the home, forgetting that it hadn't seemed very holy to him lately. Samuel continued along the lines of the right to happiness. Marjorie's husband mentioned firearms and the divorce court. Then suddenly he stopped and scrutinized both of them. Marjorie a pitiful collapse on the sofa, Samuel haranguing the furniture in a consciously heroic pose. "'Go upstairs, Marjorie,' he said in a different tone. "'Stay where you are,' Samuel countered quickly. Marjorie rose, wavered, and sat down, rose again, and moved hesitatingly toward the stairs. "'Come outside,' said her husband to Samuel. "'I want to talk to you.' Samuel glanced at Marjorie, tried to get some message from her eyes. Then he shut his lips and went out. There was a bright moon, and when Marjorie's husband came down the steps, Samuel could see plainly that he was suffering, but he felt no pity for him. They stood and looked at each other a few feet apart, and the husband cleared his throat as though it were a bit husky. Uh, that's, that's my wife, he said quietly. And then a wild anger surged up inside him. Damn you, he cried, and hit Samuel in the face with all his strength. In that second, as Samuel slumped to the ground, it flashed to him that he'd been hit like that twice before, and simultaneously the incident altered like a dream. He felt suddenly awake. Mechanically, he sprang to his feet and squared off. The other man was waiting, fists up, a yard away, but Samuel knew that though physically he had him by several inches and many pounds, he wouldn't hit him. The situation had miraculously and entirely changed. A moment before Samuel had seemed to himself heroic, now he seemed the cad, the outsider. And Marjorie's husband silhouetted against the lights of the little house, the eternal heroic figure, the defender of his home. 
There was a pause, and then Samuel turned quickly away and went down the path for the last time. 4. Of course, after the third blow, Samuel put in several weeks at conscientious introspection. The blow years before at Andover had landed on his personal unpleasantness. The workmen of his college days had jarred the snobbishness out of his system, and Marjorie's husband had given a severe jolt to his greedy selfishness. It threw women out of his ken until a year later, when he met his future wife for the only sort of woman worthwhile seemed to be the one who could be protected, as Marjorie's husband had protected her. Samuel could not imagine his grass-widow, Mrs. Deferiac, causing any righteous blows on her own account. His early thirties found him well on his feet. He was associated with old Peter Carhart, who was in those days a national figure. Carhart's physique was like a rough model for a statue of Hercules, and his record was just as solid, a pile made for the pure joy of it without cheap extortion or shady scandal. He'd been a great friend of Samuel's father, but he watched the son for six years before taking him into his own office. Heaven knows how many things he controlled at the time—mines, railroads, banks, whole cities. Samuel was very close to him knew his likes and dislikes, his prejudices, weaknesses, and many strengths. One day Carhart sent for Samuel, and closing the door of his inner office, offered him a chair and a cigar. "'Everything okay, Samuel?' he asked. "'Why, yes. I've been afraid you're getting a bit stale.' "'Stale?' Samuel was puzzled. "'You've done no work outside the office for nearly ten years.' Well, I've had vacations in the Adirond, Carhart waved this aside. I mean outside work, seeing the things move that we've always pulled the strings of here. No, admitted Samuel, I haven't. So, he said abruptly, I'm going to give you an outside job that'll take about a month. Samuel didn't argue. He rather liked the idea, and he made up his mind that, whatever it was, he would put it through just as Carhart wanted it. That was his employer's greatest hobby, and the men around him were as dumb under direct orders as infantry subalterns. "'You'll go to San Antonio and see Hamill,' continued Carhart. "'He's got a job on hand, and he wants a man to take charge.' Hamill was in charge of the Carhart interests in the Southwest, a man who'd grown up in the shadow of his employer, and with whom, though they'd never met, Samuel had had much official correspondence. "'When do I leave?' "'You'd better go tomorrow,' answered Carhart, glancing at the calendar. "'That's the first of May. I'll expect your report here on the first of June.' Next morning Samuel left for Chicago, and two days later he was facing Hamill across a table in the office of the Merchants' Trust in San Antonio. It didn't take long to get the gist of the thing. It was a big deal in oil which concerned the buying up of seventeen huge adjoining ranches. This buying up had to be done in one week, and it was a pure squeeze. Forces had been set in motion that put the seventeen owners between the devil and the deep sea, and Samuel's part was simply to handle the matter from a little village near Pueblo. With tact and efficiency, the right man could bring it off without any friction, for it was merely a question of sitting at the wheel and keeping a firm hold. Hamill, with an astuteness many times valuable to his chief, had arranged a situation that would give a much greater clear gain than any dealing in the open market. Samuel shook hands with Hamill, arranged to return in two weeks, and left for San Felipe, New Mexico. It occurred to him, of course, that Carhart was trying him out. Hamill's report on his handling of this might be a factor in something big for him, but even without that he would have done his best to put the thing through. Ten years in New York hadn't made him sentimental, and he was quite accustomed to finish everything he began, and a little bit more. All went well at first. There was no enthusiasm, but each one of the seventeen ranchers concerned knew Samuel's business, knew what he had behind him, 
and that they had as little chance of holding out as flies on a window pane. Some of them were resigned. Some of them cared like the devil, but they talked it over, argued with lawyers, and couldn't see any possible loophole. Five of the ranchers had oil, the other twelve were part of the chance, but quite as necessary to Hamill's purpose in any event. Samuel soon saw that the real leader was an early settler named McIntyre, a man of perhaps fifty, gray-haired, clean-shaven, bronzed by forty New Mexico summers, and with those clear, steady eyes that Texas and New Mexico weather are apt to give. His ranch had not as yet shown oil, but it was in the pool, and if any man hated to lose his land, McIntyre did. Everyone had rather looked to him at first to avert the big calamity, and he'd hunted all over the territory for the legal means with which to do it, but he had failed, and he knew it. He avoided Samuel assiduously, but Samuel was sure that when the day came for the signatures, he would appear. It came, a baking May day, with hot wave rising off the parched land as far as eyes could see, and as Samuel sat stewing in his little improvised office, a few chairs, a bench, and a wooden table, he was glad the thing was almost over. He wanted to get back east, the worst way, and join his wife and children for a week at the seashore. The meeting was set for four o'clock, and he was rather surprised at three-thirty when the door opened and McIntyre came in. Samuel could not help respecting the man's attitude and feeling a bit sorry for him. McIntyre seemed closely related to the prairies, and Samuel had the little flicker of envy that city people feel toward men who live in the open. Afternoon said McIntyre, standing in the open doorway with his feet apart and his hands on his hips. "'Hello, Mr. McIntyre,' Samuel rose, but omitted the formality of offering his hand. He imagined the rancher cordially loathed him, and he hardly blamed him. McIntyre came in and sat down leisurely. "'You got us,' he said suddenly. This didn't seem to require any answer. When I heard Carhart was in back of this, he continued, I gave up. Mr. Carhart is, began Samuel, but McIntyre waved him silent. Don't talk to me about the dirty sneak thief. Mr. McIntyre said Samuel briskly, if this half hour is to be devoted to that sort of talk. Ah, dry up, young man, McIntyre interrupted. You can't abuse a man who'd do a thing like this. Samuel made no answer. It's simply a dirty filch. They're just are skunks like him, too big to handle. You're being paid liberally, offered Samuel. Shut up, roared McIntyre suddenly. I want the privilege of talking. He walked to the door and looked out across the land, the sunny, steaming pasturage that began almost at his feet and ended with the gray-green of the distant mountains. When he turned around, his mouth was trembling. "'Do you fellows love Wall Street?' he asked hoarsely. "'Or wherever you do your dirty scheming?' He paused. "'I suppose you do.' No quitter gets so low that he doesn't sort of love the places he's worked, where he sweated out the best he's had in him. Samuel watched him awkwardly. McIntyre wiped his forehead with a huge blue handkerchief and continued. I reckon this rotten old devil had to have another million. I reckon we're just a few of the poor he's blotted out to buy a couple more carriages or something. He waved his hand toward the door. I built a house out there when I was seventeen with these two hands. I took a wife there at twenty-one. Added two wings, and with four mangy steers I started out. Forty summers I have saw the sun come up over those mountains and drop down red as blood in the evening before the heat drifted off and the stars came out. I've been happy in that house. 
My boy was born there, and he died there late one spring, in the hottest part of an afternoon like this. Then the wife and I lived there alone like we'd lived before. I sort of tried to have a home, after all, not a real home, but nigh it. Because the boy always seemed around close somehow, and we expected a lot of nights to see him running up the path to supper. His voice was shaking so he could hardly speak, and he turned again to the door, his gray eyes contracted. That's my land out there, he said, stretching out his arm. My land, by God. It's all I've got in the world, and ever wanted. He dashed his sleeve across his face, and his tone changed as he turned slowly and faced Samuel. But I suppose it's got to go when they want it. It's got to go. Samuel had to talk. He felt that in a minute more he would lose his head, so he began as level-voiced as he could in the sort of tone he saved for disagreeable duties. It's business, Mr. McIntyre, he said. It's inside the law. Perhaps we couldn't have bought out two or three of you at any price, but most of you did have a price. Progress demands some things. Never had he felt so inadequate, and it was with the greatest relief that he heard hoofbeats a few hundred yards away. But at his words the grief in McIntyre's eyes had changed to fury. You and your dirty gang of crooks, he cried. Not one of you has got an honest love for anything on God's earth. You are heard of money, swine. Samuel rose, and McIntyre took a step toward him. You long-winded dude. You got our land. Take that for Peter Carhart. He swung from the shoulder, quick as lightning, and down went Samuel in a heap. Dimly he heard steps in the doorway, and knew that someone was holding McIntyre, but there was no need. The rancher had sunk down in his chair and dropped his head in his hands. Samuel's brain was whirring. He realized that the fourth fist had hit him, and a great flood of emotion cried out that the law that had inexorably ruled his life was in motion again. In a half daze he got up and strode from the room. The next ten minutes were perhaps the hardest of his life. People talk of the courage of convictions, but in actual life a man's duty to his family may make a rigid corpse seem a selfish indulgence of his own righteousness. Samuel thought mostly of his family, yet he never really wavered. That jolt had brought him too. When he came back in the room there were a lot of worried faces waiting for him, but he didn't waste any time explaining. Gentlemen, he said, Mr. McIntyre has been kind enough to convince me that in this matter you are absolutely right, and the Peter Carhart interests absolutely wrong. As far as I'm concerned, you can keep your ranches to the rest of your days. He pushed his way through an astounded gathering and within a half hour he'd sent two telegrams that staggered the operator into complete unfitness for business. One was to Hamill in San Antonio, one was to Peter Carhart in New York. Samuel didn't sleep much that night. He knew that for the first time in his business career he'd made a dismal, miserable failure. But some instinct in him, stronger than will, deeper than training, had forced him to do what would probably end his ambitions and his happiness. But it was done, and it never occurred to him that he could have acted otherwise. Next morning two telegrams were waiting for him. The first was from Hamill. It contained three words. You blamed idiot. The second was from New York. Deal off. Come to New York immediately, Carhart. Within a week, things had happened. Hamill quarreled furiously and violently defended his scheme. He was summoned to New York and spent a bad half hour on the carpet in Peter Carhart's office. 
He broke with the Carhart interests in July, and in August Samuel Meredith, at thirty-five years old, was to all intents made Carhart's partner. The fourth fist had done its work. I suppose that there's a caddish streak in every man that runs crosswise across his character and disposition and general outlook. With some men it's secret, and we never know it's there until they strike us in the dark one night. But Samuel's showed when it was in action, and the sight of it made people see red. He was rather lucky in that, because every time his little devil came up it met a reception that sent it scurrying down below in a sickly, feeble condition. That was the same devil, the same streak that made him order Gilly's friends off the bed, that made him go inside Marjorie's house. If you could run your hand along Samuel Meredith's jaw, you'd feel a lump. He admits he's never been sure which fist left it there, but he wouldn't lose it for anything. He says there's no cad like an old cad, and sometimes just before making a decision, it's a great help to stroke his chin. The reporters call it a nervous characteristic, but it's not that. It's so he can feel again the gorgeous clarity, the lightning sanity of those four fists. End of the Four Fists by F. Scott Fitzgerald